Uh, let me just do this. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our bi-monthly uh, spinal cord injury uh, in-service educational updates. I'm here today with Dr. David Weinberg, who's going to be talking about adaptive sports in spinal cord injury, uh, particularly wheelchair rugby, which I think is a, a really uh, interesting and exciting topic. Uh, as usual, all of our uh, videos will be posted on YouTube if you'd like to review it at a later time. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Dr. Weinberg. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I picked my topic on adaptive sports, um, kind of as Dr. Abramov said, you're going to really focus on wheelchair rugby, but we'll talk about a few other sports. Um, I'm a second year resident here at the uh, Penn Payment R, and Dr. Abramov is my um, mentor. So moving on with the slides. Uh, so just some basic epidemiology behind SCI, usually around the world, there's about 18,000 new SCI cases per year. So at least 300,000 individuals in the U.S. Um, who live with an SEI, um, and many were athletes prior to the injury. Um, and I think that's a big thing where, you know, if you had, you know, example, there's, you know, many athletes who had an SEI playing football or any other sport, and kind of getting back to that level of competitive play is really something that's important to them. Um, and doing it in an adaptive way is something that uh, I think is what we'll kind of talk about. So... Um, what is adaptive sports? I think most of us know, but they're basically the modification of sports to accommodate individuals with either physical, cognitive, or visual disabilities. So it's not just SEI, you know, it's really for any disability modifying sports. Um, and you can either do it two ways. You can either use special equipment or there's actually some sports that are just specifically created for those with disabilities. Um, and again, just any disability. And there are tons of adaptive sports, which I'll show on the next slide. So this is um, from the uh, 2020 Paralympic Games that were in Tokyo. And they're actually in 2021, but um, they got delayed because of COVID. Uh, so just you can see, kind of read the list yourself. There's wheelchair archery, wheelchair badminton, um, canoeing, uh, you know, the list goes on and on. Um, just want to point out like an interesting game is goalball. I never even... Um, heard of it, but it's actually for the visually impaired. Um, so basically the premise of the game would be to roll um, a ball with um, bells in it and you're trying to get it into the goal and it's all just um, through auditory reception trying to block the ball based off the sound. Um, so it's something that's just kind of an interesting sport. Um, so there's tons of different ways, you know, that they can modify it to accommodate for any athlete with any disability. Um, and the list goes on and on. You know, pickleball, I think, is the new rave. Um, so there's wheelchair pickleball. Um, there's wheelchair boxing, wheelchair motocross, you know, adaptive skiing, adaptive surfing. Um, so the list sort of goes on and on. Um, and the benefits um, are numerous. You know, many of these, as we talked about, were athletes beforehand. So getting back to that team sport is something that's really pivotal. Um, you know, getting back to that competitive spirit and, you know, doing it in a way that's, you know, safe, but also in a way where they can feel like they're competing again, I think is important. And, you know, the list can help improve your functional mobility, your strength, your balance. I mean, most of these, I think we know, you know, obviously there's a huge psychosocial impact, um, you know, getting together with friends, coming together with a common goal, I think is important. Obviously you're exercising, so you're reducing cardiovascular disease, you can improve you know, your overall cardiopulmonary performance, which is can be um, limited depending on the level of um, your spinal cord injury, um, improves your ADLs, improves your endurance, and the list will just go on and on. So there's so many benefits to it. And I think it's, um, you know, a really up thing and important to talk to our patients about if they were athletes before, or even if they weren't as potential options to really get back into the community and be a part of something, again, I think is, is really important. Um, so just a little history about adaptive sports. So kind of the roots actually trace back to 1796 with the uh, gymna Gymnasticon, it was called by Francis Lowndes. So he was a inventor and he kind of created this wheel. It's basically like a flywheel, which is connected to wooden pedals on the floor. And you could also have grab bars with your hand. It's kind of similar to like the modern elliptical. And the goal was for 
um, to use it in people who were either sick or like sedentary, who didn't really exercise to try to get them to exercise again. So if you had a lower extremity injury and you had, you know, a paraplegic, you were able to use your hands to kind of pull the wheel to get some exercise. Um, more modern, um, people kind of consider Dr. Ludwig uh, Gutman, who was a German British neurologist to sort of be the founder of eventually what became the Paralympic Games. Um, so he was actually a neurologist at the National Spinal Injury Center at Stoke Manville Hospital in England. Um, and at the time he held an archery competition for a wheelchair archery competition for 16 um, like war SEI patients. Um, basically he believed that, you know, rehab through sports was something that's pivotal in recovery of, for, um, after an SCI. And eventually this sort of became onto multi-sport wheelchair events with different events. And then eventually the first summer Paralympic games occurred in 1960 in Rome, 400 competitors from 24 countries. Initially it was only athletes in wheelchairs, um, but eventually they expanded that as you know, you saw in a few earlier slides. And the first Winter Paralympic Games were actually in 1976. So kind of talking about um, wheelchair rugby. So, I, you know, many for SEI patients, many adaptive sports are really beneficial if you're, you know, paraplegic and you only have really use of your arm. But I think what's interesting about wheelchair rugby is basically no matter what your functional level is, you still can play and they have different roles for each player, which I think is a really unique thing and kind of differentiates it from other sports. Um, so basically, as long as you have C5 preserved, um, it allows you to have some elbow flexion, shoulder abduction, and um, then you can play wheelchair rugby. So basically, wheelchair rugby was initially designed as an alternative to wheelchair basketball. And the key thing is you need to have at least a functional impairment in three limbs. And there are sort of specific criteria. Um, but basically, the goal is you're trying to take the wheelchair and get a ball across the goal line from one end of the court to the other. And you have 40 seconds to score a point. Otherwise it's a turnover and you can see the possession. Um, and it's not just an SCI you can actually be any um, disability where you have an impairment in three limbs. Um, so again, the rules, you're basically playing with a volleyball on a basketball court. There's four quarters. They last about eight minutes each, and then it can go into overtime. Um, there's four players per team on the court at once. I believe there's 12 players in total that can play. And again, kind of the objective is to carry, dribble, or pass the ball to score a goal. Um, and a key thing is contact is allowed. It's a, as you can see in the picture, it's a pretty physical sport, um, but it must be done safely. So, you, you know, you can't hit someone from behind with the wheelchair. Um, you can actually make physical contact, but you can hit them from the side. Um, and basically the goal is to try to prevent them from scoring the ball, um, across the line. And, you know, you can either pass the ball, you can roll it, you could dribble it, you can carry it. Um, you can only hold the ball for about 10 seconds before you have to, um, you know, either pass or, or bounce the ball. And then a 40 seconds would be a turnover. Um, and then I think what's interesting is, is the max amount of combined sort of functional points is eight. So kind of talk about this on the next slide. Um, so each player is actually assigned a functional point based off their upper extremity strength testing. Um, so I kind of have a chart here, which I'll dive into a little bit more of the specifics. But lower functional point players tend to have a more defensive role and higher functional point players have more of an offensive role. So basically you have to add up the point totals so that it can exceed eight. So for example, if you had two three point players so they'd be three and three is six. The max you could have is two points. You could have, you know, a one, a one point player and a one point player, or, you know, a 1.5 and a 0.5. Um, and basically the functional point system, I would say is generally correlated to your neurologic level of injury. Um, so with lower points sort of equating to a higher level of injury. Um, so sort of a half a point would probably be more like a C5 neurologic level, um, you know, one point you know, it kind of gets a little blurred, the lines, but generally as it goes down, it goes down to 3.5 where you're more at probably like a T1 level um, from a spinal cord perspective. Um, I kind of talked about it here and I'll go into more specifics on the next slides. Um, but defensive athletes tend to be your lower point players. So their role is more blocking. Um, so they're like a 0.5, 1, 1.5. They're sort of defensively and your major offensive players would be higher 
um, functional points. Um, so just getting more into the specifics, you kind of get a sense of what it is. Um, so for example, like a functional point to be classified a functional point of 0.5, you would need to have, um, you can have up to full strength in your deltoid or biceps, so the C5 being intact, but you cannot have more than like a one out of five strength in your triceps or lats or um, the sternal head of the pectoralis. Um, so again, kind of similar to your C5 neurologic level of injury. At this point, you're mostly just a blocker, you know, not much function of the hands, um, really can't handle the ball. Um, you can, you know, catch the ball into your lap. Um, you can possibly bat the ball down. Um, if it's, you know, near the shoulder level. Um, so there is a functional role. And then the wheelchair, um, you know, at a C5 level might be a little more difficult to handle a manual wheelchair, but they can have modifications. I, I don't know if anyone, you know, I tried to look this up, but, you know, if anyone's watching this and, and knows specifically what wheelchair modifications are allowed for someone who's a 0.5 player, um, I tried to look in the rule book, but I couldn't find anything specifically, um, you know, where they would need maybe like spokes on the side to help wheel um, was a little unclear to me. But I mean, if anyone knows, and I would be happy to learn more about it. Um, and then kind of moving down like functional class of 1.5, as you can see here, um, basically of your full strength in your biceps and deltoid, you have four out of five strength, your wrist extensors, so at least C6 is intact, usually like between four, four minus of uh, your pectoralis, three, they call it three plus, um, but you must have less than three, uh, three out of five strength of your lat dorsis and the um, sternal head of your pectoralis. So again, similar to more of like a C7 neurologic level of injury. Um, and again, your role, you can be a blocker. You have some use of your, you know, uh, elbow extension. Um, so maybe some use of, of kind of catching the ball in your lap and batting it around a little bit. Um, while like functional class of 3.0, this is where your major offensive players are. Um, so you have full triceps, biceps, wrist extension, strength. You have near full finger um, flexion and extension, you know, weak in your interosseal, your lumbar coals. So maybe grip strength is impaired a little bit. Um, but you're still going to be one of the major players handling the ball, you, you know, be able to dribble. Um, you could have increased wheelchair speed. Um, so again, similar maybe to C8, T1. It's not perfectly aligned, but, you know, I think generally is what it's correlated to. Um, and then just talking about like the wheelchair modifications in general in adaptive sports. So they're different than, you know, a normal manual wheelchair used for community distances. Um, I think in general, they all have increased camber, which is the um, angle of the measurement of the angle of the wheels in relation to the ground. Um, so this helps with agility. It helps with stability. It also helps like preventing damage of the hand so they won't get caught in between if you're wheeling it. Um, Another thing is having front and back casters. It kind of prevents tipping of the chair, allows for quicker turning. And then different players will can modify the C height or angle, depending on especially what sport you're playing. You know, if you're playing basketball, for example, um, you might want a little bit of a higher seat for taller players or to get closer to shooting uh, to, the, to the rim. Um, but you might want to be a little bit lower if you're a dribbler in basketball, let's say, and you want to be able to maneuver the ball. So it kind of depends on your goal um, in different sports. Um, in wheelchair rugby also will depend on, you know, if you're an offensive or de defensive player, you'll have a different wheelchair. Um, so in general, sort of a higher back for better trunk control. Definitely have a higher seat angle to prevent dislodgement. It's like, a, you know, there's a pretty physically um, tough game to play. You know, you're getting hit um, with your chair. So trying to prevent that is important. Um, usually you have a front bumper, <coughs> which you can kind of help strike the opposing wheelchairs. You can sort of hold on to them to prevent them um, sort of from getting past the goal. Um, you can have spoke guards on themselves. Um, in general, offensive chairs tend to be a little faster. They're more mobile. Um, and you're kind of, as I talked about, the wings and spoke guards prevent hooking and the degree of camber, which we, we talked about. Um, defensive wheelchair, um, tend to have a lower seat height. So they can have sort of these front pickers out here, try to help to hook and hold onto other wheelchairs. 
with the goal of trying to prevent them within the 40 seconds of getting the ball across. Again, probably even more increased camber um, to have a little more power. You'd have a little less um, straight line velocity, though, but it would, you know, you might have a little more um, mobility that way. And then kind of that longer front end. And all wheelchairs are inspected and must meet a criteria um, by like the wheelchair rugby um, official governing board um, prior to any match. Um, so just some, this is a topic, you know, you can make a whole presentation on MSK injuries and adaptive sports patients. Um, but, you know, with any adaptive sports, I think, um, you know, you're really going to get, see the upper extremity injuries, your shoulder, wrist, elbows, um, shoulder r rotator cuff impingement is very common pathology. Um, why is that besides, you know, you're using a lot of, um, overhead activities. It's, you know, also when you're in a wheelchair, you tend to be in a more protracted position sort of leaning forward, um, which can actually decrease the subacromial space. Um, and your shoulders also tend to be a little more abducted. Um, so even just working with physical therapy to try to reproper um, your scapular sort of alignment is something important to sort of prevent um, impingement syndrome um, moving forward. Carpal tunnel syndrome, um, also very prevalent. Um, heterotopic ossification, another one um, very prevalent in athletes can lead to decreased range of motion in your joints um, and common in a spinal cord injury pathology. And in wheelchair rugby, you know, there's a lot of contact. You're, you're at risk for lower extremity injuries, too. So it's not always just upper extremity, but because of the nature of the sport, um, you know, that's something to keep in mind. Um, another topic could make a whole lecture on, just going to really just touch on it briefly, is autonomic dysreflexia. Um, so basically, uh, this occurs in patients who have um, a spinal cord injury level, generally T6 and above. Um, you'll have a noxious stimuli sort of below the level of lesion. It causes um, an afferent fibers to react and shoot up, which activates the sympathetic neuro nervous system that's working below the level of lesion. It's just not getting the signal from the brain. This will kind of cause a huge surge and sympathetic, uh, huge sympathetic surge below the level of lesion. Um, normally, your parasympathetics would be activated and sort of act to downregulate this. But, you know, if there's a lesion where it can't get through, then there's only going to be compensatory parasympathetics above the level of lesion. Um, so one of the things that is seen, in, especially in the, the adaptive sports world, is sort of boosting, which is basically self-inducing autonomic dysreflexia. And the goal would be to you can boost performance because, you know, the lower sympathetics are more activated, so you're increasing your oxygen consumption, higher blood pressure, increased tissue perfusion, leading to generally better performance. Um, obviously, this is totally banned by the International Paralympic Committee. Um, the way they would do this would be, depending on where you are, you can kind of wind your leg straps too tightly to induce AD. Um, if you had a catheter, you can cap the catheter to try to create um, some urinary retention. Obviously, this is pretty dangerous. You're risking UTI, you know, blood pressure, risking cardiac arrhythmias. Um, you get flash pulmonary edema from the hypertension. Um, so, you know, it's not advised, but it does happen. And then just talking general adaptive sports organizations, there's a lot. U.S. Paralympics Club, Adaptive Sports USA, Disabled Sports USA. There's actually going to be part of, in a, um, it's called Life's Rolls On. It's in Wildwood, New Jersey. It's on August 6th this year. It's an adaptive surfing event. If anyone is listening, it's interesting. I'll be there. Dr. Abramoff will be there. It's a great event to help out, um, you know, kind of that population. So if you're available and want to register, I think registration opens June 24th. Um, and then if you're interested in just watching it, the next Paralympic Games will be in Paris um, next summer. And there is the 2024 European Wheelchair Rugby Championships are in um, February next year. This year, um, Georgia, the country of Georgia actually won the wheelchair 2023 championship. So, um, and yeah, these are my references. So thank you for listening, everyone. And I hope you learned something. Thanks, David. Uh, that was a really great presentation and exactly kind of the type of education we're looking for in these uh, sessions. Uh, I'd like to open it up to any questions from uh, those listening in. Hey, this, this is uh, Taylor. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, great talk, David. <laughs> I, I really appreciated that you went into 
actually how wheelchair rugby is played um, and like the rules of the sport. I think, you know, so often we talk about these adaptive sports that are available to our patients without really having that knowledge and taking the time to look into that. So that was actually really helpful. And um, I'm glad you did that. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate it. Any other questions? So if you want to be like a Olympic para athlete physician and uh, treat these patients at the highest level, what approach should one take? How does one really get involved with this at kind of the more uh, formal levels? Um, I mean, I'm not sure on too sure on the specifics, but I would assume, um, you know, getting involved at the lower levels with your local adaptive sports USA um, club, you know, different events, trying to network. And um, I think it's like any, you know, thing in life, just sort of networking. And it's all about who you know. <laughs> Should you do uh, sports but, medicine? Should you do spinal cord injury medicine? Do you think oh, specifically? Um, I mean, you know, I think PM&R training is important. I think either SEI or, you know, sports medicine with a PM&R background, I think would be you know, both, I'm sure both are, are needed. Do you know anything about the, out. do you know anything about like the certification process to become a like clinician certifier? I, I do not know. So that's a good first step for people who are like interested is being able to like score and, you know, classify patients uh, or individuals with um, spinal cord injury and disability. That way you can um, uh, get to know some of the athletes and get, get involved that way as well. But volunteering is also a great way to get started too. Any other questions? Well, just a comment, David. I appreciated the historical information because that was uh, new to me. So thanks uh, for that. Uh, no problem. I'm a history guy, so. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> OK, well, great, everybody. Uh, thanks so much. And if any other questions come up, uh, you know where to find Dr. Weinberg. Thank you. Thanks. Okay.